Ting Yuala Jimbalm. I'm actually from First Languages Australia. Um, just sounded like we were both from the ABC for a minute there. <laughs> And we're here to talk about the partnership between our two organisations and some great results that have come out of that. Uh, five years ago, if you were to look anywhere in Australian media to try and see references to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, I think you would have drawn a complete blank. And that was one of the drivers behind the First Languages Australia um, promotion and media strategy. We aim to work with the media and other streams to create knowledge, respect and support for our languages and language programs nationally. So in line with this, we've partnered with NITV, ICTV, AIM, Qantas and internationally with Global Voices and the Endangered Languages Project. But perhaps the most powerful partnership of all has been with the ABC. And our first project was Mother Tongue. Yes, so our first project was Mother Tongue, um, which ran in started in 2014 to 2015. Um, so this project involved regional content makers, ABC content makers, to work with local communities in their region to produce short form videos. Um, and we have found this approach to really work. Um, in total, we had 101 videos made um, and they were shown on ABC TV, ABC iView, social media, etc. And four years later, they're still on our platforms and being used. Um, so here's an example, a compilation video, if we can play this video. So since then, that was started in 2014 and went to 2015, as I said. Um, and that was a project with ABC Regional. And then since then, we have introduced FLA to the rest of ABC, um, which has brought in out a lot of many other partnerships, and especially in the digital online space. Mm. And can I just say about all of those short videos are uh, made available back to the community for their own use and make terrific teaching resources people have reported back to us. Yeah. Um, then as well, we moved on to radio station IDs, um, a fantastic opportunity. Now 130 of them have been recorded and are being broadcast across the 48 regional stations. That's an ongoing project and more of them are being recorded this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. so if you want to record an <laughs> ID for your local regions, come and find me or Rudy and we can record some as well. Um, and another project which has just launched, which is ABC Kids Listen, which we're also recording, is recording um, teaching, it's a new digital radio station for kids. And so they have incorporated words in all international languages, so um, in Spanish and French and whatnot. And we are trying to make sure there's a lot of indigenous languages on this digital radio station as well. So if you have a word that you would like to teach a kid, come and um, the kids come and find me, we can record that as well. And really um, new, wonderful, exciting news is that Play School is about to start um, producing regularly the stories and songs in language. And one of the first filming of that's going to be with Anna Lee in Newcastle at Terry, Terry Lee, sorry, <laughs> um, at Edgeworth. What is it, Edgeworth School? Edgeworth Public. Yeah. yeah. And so the little videos will be shown through the window on Play School. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else have we got? Um, a national languages competition that's in its third year now, open to all schools and communities across Australia through ABC Splash. Um, and also Triple J are really keen to get young Indigenous voices and language onto Triple J. Um, so that's uh, from you know 15 to 30, the age bracket is. And they're also really interested in getting actual young Indigenous presenters. So if there's some people in your communities on the local radio stations, um, that you think would be really great for Triple J, um, let us know because they really want to start scouting some talent. And already quite a few of the people in this room have been recorded for the Word Up series on Radio National, but that's ongoing. We're sort of always looking for other people to be included in that one. Yep. Oh, ABC Classic FM put audio recordings of our speakers to classical music during NAIDOC. Um. Um. Then the, this year's is... So this saints. year we have a new project launching, um, which is going to be around place names. Um, so we have dedicated... So the, in ABC Regional, there's 48 regions. Um, and so each region is creating 
minimum of one video working with their local community around place names. Um, these videos can probably range around three to ten minutes, um, as well as uh, audience content generated. We're taking videos that if you'd like to make your video yourself and you can submit it to mm. ABC as well. Mm. Um, it's important to note that all ownership is belongs to the communities. Um, even if it is created by ABC, the community still own the video. Mm. Um, and we have some brochures with my details on it. So if you would like to get involved, um, just send us an email. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing about the ABC Open um, projects. They invite the community to actually make their own material, don't they? So yeah. it doesn't have to be made by the ABC. The yeah. community can make their own and upload them themselves. So that's sort of like skills development. Yeah. So any questions or did you want to play one of the? Oh, um, I can play it. Well, I'll quickly play a radio ID just so you yeah. know what it sounds like when you're driving through. Yamadumaran, would you go along? You and Nadi Lana love it. Virandi Parks, Rajri Noombang. Are you well, friends? My name is Lana Love from Parks, Rajri Country. Lindu Yama Udagabinya, ABC Central West. You're listening to ABC Central West. So they're played in Pacific regions as you're driving along. Yeah. And yeah, so we're recording those. So if anyone wants to record one, come and find us. Okay. Thank okay, thank you. Um, first, let me acknowledge um, the wonderful country we're on, the, um, the country of the uh, Yugambe people. Um, pay my respects. Also acknowledge my mother's country, Kalkadoon country, that my daughter Yale and I um, come uh, where our heritage is connected to through my mother. Okay, could um, before we play, I've got a short video. Before we play that, um, I'd just like to, um, uh, t um, the na I come from the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence. Um, uh, the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence has a, uh, is in the heart of Redfern, um, in the old Redfern Primary School. We have a range of uh, programs and services there, from a, a large um, a fitness centre, um, we have uh, camps and conferences, accommodation for um, 95 beds, um, and I have programs around um, children's uh, services, which is an after-school program, uh, and school holiday program. We have a tackling Indigenous, um, indigenous smoking program, and, and I've today Today I'm speaking around our Indigenous Digital Excellence Program. So if we could play the video, please. And I'd just like to mention that, um, that uh, the, uh, the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence actually uh, sits on the land of the Gadigal um, people of the Eora Nation. Someone asked around uh, um, the resources. So the IDX journey, Indigenous Digital Excellence journey, started back in 2013, and that was a partnership between the Telstra Foundation um, and the and NCIE. I know you hate acronyms, um, brother, but um, uh, so so um, and that was a five million dollar investment, um, and we're 18 months out of that um, uh, of that uh, you, you know that um, partnership. Um, um, you know, some decisions around where that might go into the future. So you heard there, there's a Flint program. So that Flint program um, is a, is um, a, um, it, it, that's about Flint. That's about, um, um, you know, that vision that NCIE has and, and Flint has is about um, helping our young people strive for excellence. So Flint is about, um, you know, you need a Flint to start a fire. Um, so Flint was actually, um, came about, um, about trying to ignite um, in our children um, um, interest in the, in the uh, in digital. Um, and um, so that program entails going out into community um, and, um, and designing a week-long um, program um, with local uh, communities. So partners could be schools and li libraries, um, councils, and the pr that uh, was initially around an expression of interest. Um, and what that is, is that um, the team takes out technology. So it could be, uh, it, it's 3D printing, Ozobots, um, Lego robotics, um, and, uh, and drones. Um, and so it, um, I've got to put my glasses on, I can't see you out there when I put them on, but I need to read. Um, so also that program, that's a $25,000 uh, package. Um, 
and um, and that's um, into uh, regional and remote communities. Um, and what that is is that it actually it's a it's a week long program, and um, we leave ten thousand um, uh, dollars worth of equipment in the community, um, and that can be the the uh, technology of choice based on the training um, and exposure to the training that um, that um, children, young people, and local facilitators have had. Um, so I guess um, we have some clear principles. I, I was, um, we've, been, we've got a footprint all over Australia now, um, and we've been to all states except ACT and Tasmania. Um, in the interest of time, I won't read all those communities out, um, but they're really, you know, remote as far as um, uh, Galawinku, um, we're about to go to Roeburn, um, you know, Burke, um, up to the Torres Strait, Bamiga, um, and large regional centres um, like Rockhampton. Um, and that's where I actually um, got excitement around digital because we actually ran a program in Rockhampton and our lo through a local partnership and I at the time worked for a domestic and family violence service um, and our elders said to us our kids are disconnecting they're on the phones as Roy said um, but they're not they're not connecting with elders and families around um, having yarns around stories so our elders said we need something to help our kids connect with us um, and um, so that we got the local um, Durrambul people involved in the, in the Durrambul Youth Service as well as went into a primary school um, where we ran a workshop with 48 children from, from, the, uh, from uh, uh, year six to, uh, beg your pardon, four to six uh, in the primary school and in the, in, with the youth group um, we had 11 young people. Some clear, very clear principles around, around why the work that we do and practices, and that's around no child misses out. When I was a kid and went to school, the technology of the day were quiz and air rods. You know, those rods and you learned to do your maths and I didn't get to use those. Some, someone made a decision that that little black girl over there wasn't going to use these. So I've actually bought myself a set of quiz and air rods. But it's interesting that the manual actually talks about coding and learning experiences. Um, so that was the technology of the day. So we have a clear principle that no kids miss out, even the kids who run the muck in the school, in the community, because they're the kids that need it the most. So the other thing is that um, really, really uh, important principle is around ground up, culturally embedded, um, you know, elders involved, um, traditional owners, and we leave that to the community to work that out, you know. Um, but we have principles around being flexible, being adaptive, you know, knowing there's communities are busy, there's so much going on, so we have to work with that. Um, I've already talked about the technology we take in. And I guess um, we just had our awards recently, um, our IDX, inaugural IDX Awards in Sydney. And what we're seeing, as we're seeing here today, that there's, um, we've got children in our communities who are only seeing that technology for the first time. Um, and then we're at the other end of the spectrum, we've got, you know, our people who are young people who are developers. And, um, but I guess um, when we go in there, we have a clear intention around transferable skills and leaving and digital sustainability and cultural sustainability, leaving something there. Um, and we're working on that for the next 18 months or building on that. So we've actually been in and worked with 2,000, you know, over 2,500 children and young people um, between the ages of five and 25. Outcomes, really important because we're talking now about, you know, we, with all that effort, are we really making a difference, you know? Are we really leaving something behind or is it just like everyone else, fly in, fly out? I guess the outcomes that we're hearing and, and what community and the children are saying to, to us, we're learning about culture because we're actually using cultural maps and cultural stories um, to navigate the robots, you know, and, and um, you know, around, around the stories. So the kids are telling us they learn about culture, they learn about language. They're actually, kids are engaging where they haven't been engaging before. Um, they're actually, it's actually improving school attendance. So teachers have been saying to us, you know, that child hasn't actually engaged with us, but that child stayed here all week to, to be involved in this program. Um, they're learning, you know, they're getting self-esteem, the willingness to learn. Um, it's actually ground truthing our assumptions that um, technology, that, that technology is in the schools and our kids are getting a chance to use it. Well, they're not. Um, and um, really attention to that place-based sustainability. So we're really getting some really good social impact data. And I guess this goes to our partners. So I'll just sort of say that 
um, and acknowledge that one of our partners, um, uh, Tiandi from Microsoft, is that we're saying to our partners, we know there's a lot out there and you all want a piece of us and you all want our IP, but we want you to plug in your resources when we need it. Not when you, not for us to come to you, spend a whole day's ideation, give you all our IP, and we're saying, you know, you give us your in kind and your, and, and your dollars, but when we actually need it. Um, and, and I guess in terms of those outcomes, there's that tra transferal of skills and knowledge also to our partners, um, and then they can make decisions about where they put their investments in the future. And I'll just say, um, just we do have a roadmap strategy, which is about local, regional, uh, leadership, national leadership connection. Um, and I guess um, just to say that this really is, after being a public servant for over 30 years, I'm saying this has got to be intentional, purposeful. Um, you know, we have to invert that pyramid. We have to think individual, family, community. Um, like Xavier's, you know, spin it on its head thing that he said. Um, we have to drive this ourselves. Um, and that, you know, we've actually got to redesign the legislation, the policy, the funding models that go with it and be really going to treasuries, you know, Commonwealth State Treasury and not mucking around with ministers. But anyway, that's just my view. I can say that now because I'm not a public servant anymore. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm just going to sort of leave it there. Thank you. I'd like to pay respects to the Yugambe um, people. Um, Ningala Neri Terry Banjalang Dube. Um, um, Mari. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm Mari Ridwin um, from uh, Wales, from Cymru, um, another in a, a language that has been suffered from uh, the interference of England as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so true. Um, so we're here just to talk about, um, you know, Murabai's um, always been very good at producing um, dictionaries in language because we're responsible for language seven languages across the east coast of New South Wales. Unfortunately, with um, Bundjalung, we have so many dialects and we have a vast um, array of materials, which is too numerous to put into a bound book. So um, could we get up the website, please? Hi. What it is, is because we have vast um, dialects in Bundjalung, the actual website, which you can't actually see, but on this little map on the site, you can see the different colour codes, and that's how it's displayed in the actual dictionary. Can you get that up? Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. You've got Yugambeh, Gold Coast, Mob, Go to, oh, I can't see that, Wallable, yeah, all around that area. So the whole dictionary is colour coded on the website. I think the most important thing is, you know, our other dictionaries are you have to purchase, okay? The one thing about this resource is free. What can you get for free these days? And this is up there. So as you can see, colour coded for different dialects. Probably the one of the most um, easiest thing. The downside is you have to have a computer. You've also got to have internet. Smartphone, okay? But you've also got to have coverage of that smartphone. In my area, my mob's from Bayugal Way, which is northwest of Grafton, there is no phone coverage. So it is really difficult to get to. I could mention that this, um, Murbai has produced, now this is the last of the um, languages to have, the, have a dictionary produced. All the other dictionaries are paper dictionaries for the other six languages um, that we look after in the Murbai um, regional area from the sort of border of um, Queensland down to uh, just north of Sydney. But um, this particular dictionary was very difficult to produce as a published paper text because it actually covers so many different um, dialects and la different languages, <laughs> basically, um, which are all colour coded. And to, pr to print a book in colour with every page in colour was so prohibitively expensive mm -hmm. that we've done it online, but it is possible to download it um, from the website as well. Mm. I mean, to print it out. If you've got pages and pages that you want to print out. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably the most important thing is, you know, we were funded under the Indigenous Languages Support Program, which was a few years ago. So, and that's the Australian Government, of course. Okay, this is um, one page of the 
Gumbangir uh, online course, which we're in the process of developing. It's not actually um, live yet. And um, the first, uh, well, one thing I'd just like to mention is that the idea was to produce something for people who are not, who are Gumbangir people, but who are living off country, because we often got people requesting uh, language lessons. We run a certificate three at the moment, for example, in Gumbangir. Uh, in Nambaka Heads, where Mordbai is located, but um, there are people who aren't able to make it to classes either because of they can't get there or because they're living off country. So the idea was to produce a pilot um, online course. Um, and somebody mentioned cost before. There are three things I'd like to mention here very quickly. One is cost, one is accessibility and longevity, and the other is ease of use. And the first issue was cost. We wanted to do this, but we didn't have any money. Um, so uh, what we did was I was already thinking about it, and we read the program for the Pulima uh, conference that was coming up uh, later in the year and saw that somebody had a language um, shell that they were developing, and that was Kathy Bow at NTU. And we thought, let's not wait let's just ring her up now and see if we can get involved in this, which we did. And um, so I've been working with Cathy um, over a few months now to uh, develop an online course in Gumbangir, which still isn't finished because it takes a bit of time to do it. But the, the main thing is that I think a lot of us have been horrified in the past at uh, language materials that have cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to produce um, CDs and apps and things that have been really, really expensive and very fantastic, but you can't do anything with them once they get out of date. You can't ad adapt them for other languages. It's just a, something that's produced and done and it's cost a lot of money. What we wanted was some way to do something that we could keep updating, keep changing, and that would stay up to date. So and that wouldn't cost anything. So we were able to, um, the wonderful thing about this shell is that it's um, based on um, WordPress. We all, uh, we, it's called LearnPress, but it uses WordPress. And um, our website was already a, a WordPress site. So the only cost we had was to update the theme so that it was a theme that supported uh, LearnPress. Um, and it was time for it to be updated anyway, so that was, um, we had to pay somebody else to do that. That was something we couldn't do ourselves. Um, but everything else about it is fantastic because it means that we could, um, we didn't need special IT people and um, it was something that could be done by sort of just Googling online, how do you do this and how do you do that? And if you're absolutely desperate and get stuck, ring Cathy and ask for help. <laughs> so that's what we did. The other thing is about accessibility and longevity. Um, in the past, um, I worked in the Department of New South Wales Department of Education, and we produced a lot of resources that were very expensive and that required a lot of input from IT uh, support in the department and so on. They've all gone now. I mean, they were there for a few years, and then suddenly somebody at some level decided, okay, we're clearing everything off the language's website, and that was it. It was gone. So um, we wanted to have something that we could, uh, you know, have control over and that wasn't likely to disappear. Um, WordPress is the most used um, platform, CMS um, platform used at 20% 20, 20 of websites or WordPress sites, so we reckon that WordPress isn't going to disappear in a hurry. Um, so, and it will keep being upgraded so we can work with it, you know, and as it introduces new technologies and, and the ability to do new things, we'll be there ready to, to do them when we can. Um, and the third thing is ease of, um, ease of use. Um, none of us have, who have been working on it have actually sort of learnt formally how to, how to use WordPress. We've done it by trial and error, by, um, you know, Googling. How do I do this? Um, uh, and so I taught myself um, how to use WordPress in the past, and the Murbai website is a WordPress site, so I'd been using that, so LearnPress was just another step. Um, we were very lucky to have a young 
millennial volunteer for a few weeks who was very adept at using it. So she um, worked with us and also taught some of the people in in Murabai, other people in Murabai how to use it, including Dallas, who you can see there. And, um, and so we've been learning all sorts of things, like uh, Dallas now does all the sound clips. I mean, he makes, he record, does the recording, he puts the recording onto a tape record, onto a um, computer, uses Audacity to chop up the film, the um, clips, and then, you know, puts it on the website, yes, yeah, so. And I'll just... That's it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you from the future. My company in digital has its footholds in India's Silicon Valley, the Philippines, and we partner with organisations in New York. And this year we'll be taking our work to Dubai, Zurich and Berlin. Our company was born in Kakadu by a Cabrigal woman working with senior traditional owners from West Arnhem. Our DNA is Aboriginal and our foothold is global. Our company focuses on telling Indigenous stories using cutting edge technologies. Our objective is the right people telling the right, in the right place, telling the right stories at the right time in the right language. We make holograms, also known as mixed reality, um, that can be seen across the landscapes of our people all without the internet. It sounds pretty futuristic, and it is, um, but with all futures, we start in the past. There's nothing sadder than a child growing up on her country without her tongue, without her stories, without her law, and without her old people. And that was me. As a child, I used to run my fingers in the petroglyphs of our people, our Madiong, our Badagadang, and I used to wonder, who put these here? What stories do they tell? Why do I have this connection to them? While I was always identified growing up on my own country as coming from somewhere else, um, I didn't reconnect with my own people till I was 29. Fortunately, just after that, I saw augmented reality at the University of Canberra for the first time. And I spent five seconds with that technology and I knew it would change my life. I went home and had a shower and the idea popped into my head um, that I was going to connect augmented reality with Indigenous cultural knowledge systems on country without the internet. And of course I was told I was crazy. Um, I had the opportunity to move to Kakadu um, back in 2015, um, which was really scary for me because I was starting out a new technology company from Canberra. And I thought, wow, um, there's not going to be any internet up there, which is going to make it pretty hard to develop um, in cutting edge tech. Um, so I decided to cast away the technology and start focusing on the important things when you are working in technology, like intellectual property, moral rights, um, and first and foremostly, why are we doing this? So I asked the community the four most important questions in the world. One is, what are you proud of? Um, two, what are you most afraid of? The third question is, what's your most pressing need? And four is, what will you do to help? That helped us uh, establish a few things, like the proud custodians of humanity's um, spoken history, as are all our peoples. They're most afraid of being the last ones with these knowledge systems. And the most pressing need is to translate it to the younger generation. And they're willing to do anything to help. So I introduced augmented reality to a group of five senior traditional owners in Ongagadu country. And we started thinking about what does it mean to put these knowledge systems into a digital environment? We started developing some question sets that would guide our framework for digitizing these knowledge systems. Um, and it's work that ended up taking me to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, um, which I've been going to for the past four years to help address, address the ethical digitalization of our knowledge systems. Um, the first question is what data is being collected on us and through us? So we've got active data that we create and then there's passive data that our machines create for us. Um, it's metadata, which is otherwise known as data about data. The second question is who owns all those data sets? The third question is, where does that data live? The fourth question is, how do you get that data back? 
And this was a really important question for me because I was wondering, what if we do something in cutting edge technology that has a perverse outcome? Or what if we do something so wildly successful in this new digital environment that it becomes of incredible value? And the fifth question was, where does that, how does that data live? So back in the 80s, my people were asked to put all their cultural knowledge stuff onto VHS so the future generations could see it and it would be there forever. Um, so I'm that and I can't see it because um, no one has a VHS player. And since then we've been through, I don't know, floppy disks, CDs, DVDs, USBs, we've got the cloud and we're starting to talk about blockchain now. Once we sorted out the intellectual property, the licensing, the data storage, digital sovereignty, we got creating something pretty special. We started scanning objects in 4D photogrammetry and using facial recognition technologies so the, com so the computers in the phones could actually identify those artworks and bring forward some 3D animations that we developed in a couple of animation suites um, called Maya and um, Unity. So we made these little cards um, from proper artwork. So these are, the originals are on um, bark, painted in ochres, very traditional ways of um, communicating these cultural stories. And we made an um, augmented reality app. So basically what the app does, and I've got some of these so you guys can see in the break, is you point the app oops, over the artwork and you can see it, it comes to you in 3D anyway and you can hear the story from the traditional owners. Um, yeah, you probably can't see that. But anyway, you're very welcome to try them in the breaks. Um, from that work last year, um, I was approached by Microsoft, which was an amazing game changer for my company. And we partnered with them to move the content from the cards and the mobile into this device, which is called HoloLens. Um, this is a fully self-contained computer. Um, and it's got incredible computational power in it. And it also allows us to interface with the real world. So my dream when I stepped out of the shower that day was that we would be able to see um, images of our peoples if they wanted or the manifestations of the stories in 3D animation, but while being immersed in the real world. So I guess there's a spectrum of realities now. <laughs> there's um, virtual reality where you put the headset on and you're fully enclosed in a different world. It could be a fully created world. Um, there's augmented realities just like I saw which are digital layers in the real world but aren't very interactive. And now there's mixed reality. So the content that we've created in this um, HoloLens, you're able to move with your hands and gestures and you can actually inter interact with holograms or animations in the real world. And the coolest thing about it is if everybody has one of these HoloLens on their head, they can have a shared experience of, of that particular hologram. So it's not an individualized experience, which I think is really important for our peoples. Um, so my focus now is sharing our work methods, frameworks and networks to amplify all the learnings we've had over the past six years working in this cutting edge tech. And I just wanted to cast your minds to the future and what that means for our peoples. We have law peoples and we have medicine peoples and we have language peoples. I think we need digital peoples as well. I think we need digital custodians in our communities who are equipped to deal with, um, with the future. Some of the future technologies that I think we all need to get our heads around are, and I hope you write these down because they're here right now and um, we have an opportunity to leapfrog and get in front in helping to design some of these technologies. Um, the first one's blockchain. I think that has amazing capacity and anything far more than the internet um, to give permissions about our language and knowledge in a digital environment, establish the provenance of that data and help us um, carry this data into perpetuity. It also has another P, payment. So blockchains can deal with payments. And um, I think blockchain's really important. I started looking at where Western societies are starting to put their money, which is one of their most valuable assets. They're putting it in blockchain. I think we need to look to where we might put our most valuable assets in a similar system. Um, the next one's artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, this is an absolute game changer for languages and digital languages. And I, I implore everybody, please get your heads around artificial intelligence for language learning. It is an absolute game changer. 
Um, mixed reality is so putting digital layers in real worlds that we can interact with. Robotics and autonomous industries. And globalised workforces. I think something that's really important message to all our people is we don't all have to be geeks. We can have the ideas and work with other people that, um, that have specialties in those skills to help us build our futures. Um, and it, the last message is, if I can create a cutting edge um, tech company that honours law, language and land from a remote community in Australia, so can we all. Thanks. Dangan Abdilla, how are you all? Uh, first up, I'm going to show a little video uh, which describes a bit about uh, the language revitalisation journey we've been on so far. Um, we're in the current um, phase of trying to fundraise for not only the, the language knowledge book, um, which uh, Darren McKenney gave us the idea of calling it that instead of just calling it a dictionary and grammar, because it's broader than just a word list, it's broader than just um, a description of the grammar and all that, because we're looking at how to, to integrate uh, cultural knowledge, place, story, all those really, really crucial things into that publication. Um, but we're completely unfunded in terms of government corporate funding. Uh, we just opened uh, the Animal Language Hub in November, uh, which has been a space donated to us by a local uh, community housing company. Um, and everything in that room has been donated either by people in the community, white followers, black followers, everybody, and also from uh, Miramar. They shipped a lot of stuff up for us, like tables and uh, tech equipment, all that. Um, we've been trying to do stuff without government funding as, uh, for as long as possible because, as we all know, the constraints and the difficult requirements put on us by government funding, whether it be reporting about KPIs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I guess onto the topic of technology, um, we've used technology to film and put together a little uh, clip like that to fundraise, to raise awareness about the program. Um, I personally, as a 23-year-old, uh, I'm probably uh, in a minority of 23-year-olds when it comes to, uh, I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to technology, but I thought I'll put my, I'll take my cynic hat off today and think about some of the positive ways in which we'd been able to utilise technology in some of the, uh, uh, some of the tasks we've got to engage with when it comes to not only uh, revitalising language, but building a strong uh, language revitalisation program around that language. Um, and those are in uh, several different areas. One of those areas is uh, promotion and engagement. So we've got a very active social media presence, uh, Animal Language Revival uh, Program's Facebook page. We're constantly updated, up updating it, constantly sharing uh, information about meetings we're having, events we're putting on, whether it be fundraising events or symposiums where we're updating people on the work that we've been doing and sharing some of the language material we've been pulling out of archives. And also, we've just launched on Invasion Day this publication called Morgung and Gun, uh, Resisting New England, Frontier Wars Edition 1. Uh, Morgung is our word for tomahawk, so we've included that uh, language uh, right on the front cover there. And we've also got um, a whole list of words that we use for different weapons that we would have used uh, for the weapons that we fought back in those Frontier Wars. Um, and the, the book details Frontier Warfare events based on archival material from 1832 into the mid-1840s. And we've chosen to, to only use this, uh, only disseminate this via a hard copy. We didn't want to make it into a PDF or something that you can download as an e-book e because we had a meeting about it and we thought things that we have on our computers, on our smartphones, on our iPads, all these devices, they get lost in, the, in the, the endless stream of information on there. Um, so we thought if, some, if everyone's got a, a copy of this in their house, at their workplace, in their library, it's a hard copy that you can sit down and go through and, and consume in a quality, in a quality way. Um, so I think we're looking at, at the quality of the consumption rather than the, the quantity of the consumption. Um, but technology was integral to developing this so we had to use software like Adobe's um, InDesign to put this public publication together. So for us, I think at the moment, technology is most useful in the development and design, design stage uh, of the language and cultural revitalization um, process rather than in, in, in the delivery. 
Um, it's also been very useful in decision-making processes. So we've got our closed Facebook group where all the members of the Animal Language Revival Program uh, Organising Committee can contribute to discussions about decisions we're making on the fly instead of waiting for our monthly meetings. Another major area where uh, technology's helped is in the research and documentation process. So we use uh, Miramar to to we input all our archival material and all the data from that material into Miramar so we can compile our language knowledge book. Uh, it's also been very useful in terms of searching for and storing data. So I'm an avid user of uh, Google Drive and Google Docs, so everything's in the cloud. If one of my uncles, one of my aunties, cousins wants to access that material, I can share that straight away with them. And there's also Trove. So Trove's not only helped uh, and for those of you who don't know, Trove is a service, an online service op uh, operated by the National Library of, of Australia, and I absolutely love it, probably a bit too much. Um, and we've used that to dig up all this, a lot of this material relating to the frontier wars, but also place names. And any, any reference to the language of the New England Tablelands, like we use all these different search terms, and, and the, the, the real flexibility and power of Trove has helped us in that process as well. Um, as I said before, uh, using programs like InDesign and Premiere Pro to put together a video like you saw before um, and in developing hard copy materials that people can consume in a quality way and also mapping software. So everyone um, commonly uses the name Anawan for our group. Anawan is the anglicised version of the name Anawan and Anawan is only one of five different dialect groups and there was never one name of, for our entire language group like linguists and anthropologists and whoever else over time homogenized it into one one name, one group. So four, the other four names disappeared off into nothingness. So we've managed to pull them names out of archival material and start to renormalize them. So we mapped all the data we have in terms of the location of those different dialect groups. And we used uh, ArcMap, or well, I can't quite remember what the software name is, but we used that to map all the data and we'll be doing the same thing with all the place names. So we've, we've, we've been heavily using technology in the back end kind of things. But in terms of delivery, I've got a little anecdote that I use whenever people say, when are you gonna make an app? Um, I used to work at a school in Armadale um, as, as an AEO, and uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the kids there were Gimilaroi, and I thought, oh, I know there's a Gimilaroi app. I'll get them to download the Gimilaroi app, and then they can be exposed to their traditional language and start using it on a regular basis. They all downloaded it, they used it for a day, and they didn't touch it again. And then that made me think of a, of a, of a line that um, a young Squamish guy over in British Columbia working on the tr revival of his traditional language, what he said, he said that uh, uh, you don't revive a language with an app, you revive language with people. And I guess we can extend that, we, re we revive language by connecting people back with country. Um, so I guess like the majority of our efforts going forward and thus far have been on, uh, on country and cultural activities. And a conference that I went to in Vancouver last year called, I think it was the First Nations Languages Conference. The whole theme of the conference was on uh, learning, uh, sorry, language learning on the land. So I thought, oh, here's a clever little way of putting it, online versus on land, I don't know. Um, so I think our focus is on land, on country, uh, cultural, uh, cultural activities, embedding language through cultural activities. So my cousin Gabby, who's voices in the video, she's uh, in a, um, working with a Gamilaroi uh, woman in Tamworth to bring back traditional weaving in the district. Um, and we've been starting to talk about how can we implement language into uh, reviving traditional weaving. So they had a lamandra harvest um, at the university I'm studying at, and there's me, there's Gabby, there's Amy from Tamworth sitting there, um, and we're, we're splitting um, the lamandra leaves, and we're just sitting there, and I'm thinking, oh, we could be sitting here sharing words for the spiders and the bugs that are coming out of the, the leaves, about the different kind of bags and different kind of things that you make with when, you, when you're weaving. So those kind of conversations in terms of reintroducing language through cultural activities, going out onto country, doing site trips, talking about the environment in language, saying, oh, look, over there there's Mbwanda, the kangaroo, that's our word for, uh, for kangaroo, that's our word for this particular tree species here. 
Um, so I guess, yeah, we're using, I guess to, to summarize, like we, we're using language, we're using technology back here when it comes to reclaiming the material and putting it into a, a form that we can reintroduce to country, that we can repatriate to country, repatriate to community and repatriate to culture. But when it comes to the delivery, uh, technology takes a, uh, takes a step to the back. Um, let's all speak soon.